Mary and the president spent much of that evening upstairs in 11-year-old Willie Lincoln's bedroom. Their son was ill with what the doctors called bilious fever, typhoid. During the days and nights that followed, Mary never left Willie's side. As she nursed him, some newspapers savaged her for having entertained so lavishly in the midst of war. Disgraceful frivolity, hilarity, and gluttony, said one. Another charge that the evening had been worthy of a woman whose sympathies are with slavery and with those who are waging war. All the while, her son grew weaker. At five in the afternoon on February 20th, Willie Lincoln died. The president lifted the cover from the face of his child, a friend remembered, and gazed at it long and earnestly, murmuring, it is hard, hard to have him die. Willie, he said, was too good for this world. But then we loved him so. Mary Lincoln did not attend her boy's burial. As Lincoln rode with Robert through a fierce storm to the cemetery, she remained in bed, inconsolable, weeping so steadily she sometimes suffered convulsions. A nurse was in constant attendance. Mary refused to see visitors could not answer the letters of sympathy pouring in from all over the country. She couldn't bear even to hear the mention of Willie's name. She couldn't enter his room. Tad was sick with the same disease, although a milder case. For days and days and days, she couldn't even bear to face Tad. Willie's toys were given away. Even flowers he had liked were barred from the White House. His mother could not bring herself to look at them. Mary would not leave her room for nearly a month. All the old fears that had haunted her life reasserted themselves. Her mother, her father, her son Eddie, now Willie. Those she loved best would be snatched from her. And this time, she saw it as a punishment from God. I had become so wrapped up in the world, so devoted to our own political advancement, that I thought of little else besides. Our Heavenly Father sees fit to visit us at such times for our worldliness. How small and insignificant all worldly honors are when we are thus so severely tried. Lincoln, too, was distraught. I never saw a man so bowed down with grief, a friend said. But unlike Mary, Lincoln, did not collapse. He did not have the time. Though devastated by his own tragedy, he would never lose sight of the greater tragedy that gripped the whole country. It's a civil war, and the central emotional experience of the country is that of loss. That touched him directly in February 1862 with the death of Willie, his favorite child dying. But he also felt everybody else's suffering. And he found the means of giving that personal and
collective suffering some kind of voice and meaning in his role as leader. Much of the time from now on, as the president labored to restore the shattered union, the woman he loved would be just one more of the many burdens he had to bear. As the war went on, Mary would retreat more and more into herself, while Lincoln would somehow find the strength to merge his own grief with the grief of his countrymen.